Well, good morning, Paragon Church. We are glad you're with us today. We have some great things going on. First big thing we've got going on this morning is a child dedication, which we'll be doing after our first couple of songs this morning. Really excited about that. I'm a little bit sad because we were supposed to have one more baby here, but unfortunately her brother got sick and was put in the hospital. I'm not sure if you guys saw that through um, our uh, email chain, but Jackson is doing much better. Uh, I don't know all the details, but he is eating and he's all low on ox or lower on the oxygen getting pumped into him. So, so things are good for that. So yes, praise God. Thank you for praying with us in that. Uh, a couple of things I also want to let you know about is after this service, we have ourselves a membership class. And if you are desiring to find out more about what Paragon Church does, how we do it, why we do it, uh, we would love for you to join us. We're going to be serving up some Dion's pizza and salad so you can come and hang out with us, hear about what we're doing. Uh, some of you have already signed up. Thank you for doing that. But we would love to have you here after church. That starts at 1130. Um, also, we'd love for you to get involved in our Bible studies and our connection groups. They've already started. It's okay to slide right in. I'm sure that uh, any one of the leaders would love to have you in there and get you plugged in, get plugged into the community that is those small groups. Because as much as I love Sunday morning, I love being able to, to sit and be able to talk, so much easier, so much better to be able to do that in the comfort of somebody's home and be able to grow just a little bit deeper. So please get involved with that. If you're new with us today, thanks so much for joining us. We also have new bulletins here, but on the back of that bulletin, there is a QR code. And we would love for you to fill that out uh, by scanning it with your phone. And when you do that, it'll take you to our membership card, kind of, or not membership card, our connection card. And we'll all be able to follow up with you, but we have a gift we'd like to give for you for, or to you for being here today. Um, today's message is found in Ecclesiastes chapter five. And the first part of the verse that we have is talking about how we approach God. And it's going to be, uh, I'm just going to give you that heads up now in case you want to leave before anything starts. It's going to be in your face. It's going to be one of those ones that kind of steps on our toes because of the way that sometimes we approach God a little too flippantly. And so today what I want to do as we approach our time of worship, our time of singing together as a congregation, our time of dedication of children to the Lord, our time of being in the Word, I'd like to ask you today to take about 30 seconds. Because I don't know what you did. I don't know how you did it when, when you came in here. Maybe you were arguing with a spouse. Maybe you were fighting with your kids. Maybe uh, you had uh, a whole lot of things about what you have to do after church on your mind. Maybe you're, you're thinking about uh, all the things that work has going on for you. I, I want you to take 30 seconds today and just ask God to, to clear that from you so we can fully focus on Him. Not be running every which way with all the things, but 30 seconds just to sit and listen, and then we'll go to our time of singing. Would you sing with us this morning? Christ the 
is a weapon. This is battle belongs. See, when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. When all I see is the battle. When all I see is the battle. You see my victory.
sing out to God. When I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. So when I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and everything I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Father God, Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, for, for who you are. God, you are a God of miracle work. You are a God who fights our battles for us. Father, I pray this morning, Lord, as Pastor Matt brings the message, Lord, as we have these child dedications, Lord, that, Lord, we come together as a church and we proclaim, Lord, that your will above all else, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Yes, there we go. It was me. It was all me. I, did, I turned it off and didn't mute it. I apologize for that. But I am grateful for the opportunity to be able to do child dedications. And uh, even as we talk today, you will see one of the things about making a vow is a very important step and a very important thing to follow through on. So this morning, we do not come to child dedication lightly. 
In my mind, it's a very big step both for the families and for the church because children are a gift from God. Psalm 127.3 proclaims this, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from Him. As believers, we're called to recognize that children first belong to God. First and foremost, they are His. God and His goodness gives children, whether they're biological or they're adopted, as gifts to parents. Not only do they have the awesome responsibility for caring for the gift, but it's also an amazing gift to be able to enjoy. Because children belong to God and are given by Him, by His grace, as gifts to parents, the only proper, appropriate response is that children be dedicated back to Him. We're told in 1 Samuel 1 that Hannah presented her son Samuel to the Lord. In Luke chapter 2, verse 22, we read that Mary and Joseph brought baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem in order to present him before the Lord. In the same way, our parents today bring their children, present it first themselves, and then their children before the Lord our God. So please look at me with these commands of God recorded in Holy Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, says these words, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. God's instructions here are plain. They tell us, parents, love God with your all. Every ounce and every fiber of your being and your energy, and then teach your children to do the same. As you love God and love one another, you will model for your children a lifelong pattern to be followed. I'm going to take this moment and invite our parents to come up, if you guys wouldn't mind coming, and bring your children with you as well. Uh, we have uh, like I said, two couples today, a third one. I did just get an update, by the way, from, from Courtney um, that Jackson is doing better. You guys can come, come on up, up on the stage if you don't mind. That way everybody can see you. I'm going to move this out of the way as well. But uh, Jackson is doing much better, but he does need to be in the hospital for a couple more days, so they will get their own individual. I think they just did it because they wanted to do one-on-one. -on -one. That's kind of what it is. But I understand that. There's, there's a selfishness factor in it all. Uh, hang out in the hospital so you don't have to come to church. I understand. Um, well, here we have, I asked them if they wanted to introduce themselves, and they did not, so I will do it for them, because I understand uh, I'm the only one who likes to talk into the mic, but we have Josh and Aubrey Hester up here, as well as Caleb, Tobin, and Evan. Hey, buddy. And then we have Trent and Annalise Harp here with Eleanor. Now, parents, this is going to be directed towards you by coming forward before God and His people. Do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourselves and your kids to the Lord? If so, please respond by saying, we do. Yeah. Having come freely to have your children dedicated, I didn't hold you guys hostage to make you come up here or do anything like that, I ask you now to enter into the following commitment in the presence of God and His people. And I want you to remember the commitment today goes far beyond the words that we say. It relies mainly on the things that you do. So that your child or your children may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers, do you, Josh, Aubrey, Trent, and Elise, vow by God's help and in partnership with the church, do you today recognize that these children are a gift of God and give heartfelt thanks to God for His blessings? Please respond by saying, we do. Do you de now dedicate your children to the Lord who gave them to you in the hope that they will belong wholly to Him? Do you pledge as parents that you will bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, making every reasonable effort with patience and love to build the word of God, the character of Christ, and the joy of the Lord into their lives? Do you promise to provide for physical, emotional, intellectual, intellectual and spiritual needs of your children, looking only to your heavenly Father for wisdom, love, and strength to serve them and not use them? Do you promise to make it your regular prayer that by God's grace, your children will come to trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins and the fulfillment of all of his promises to them, even eternal life. And in this faith, follow Jesus as Lord and obey his teachings. Not only this kind of love cannot be done alone, church. 
That's why I asked the church to also make a vow. A vow that kind of goes along with that old Proverbs when it says it takes a village to raise a child. Parents have the first responsibility, but parents also need help and support of their community. And that community is found right here in this church. That happens by investing in discipleship of the parents. That happens by investing in the kids' ministry, investing in the kids themselves, and investing in the parents themselves. So with that being said, church, I'm going to ask you to make the following commitment to those who are standing before you. So that these children may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers, do you, church, vow by God's help to be faithful in your calling as members of the bodies of Christ, to help these parents be faithful to God, to help teach and train these children in the way of the Lord so they might one day trust in Him as Lord and Savior. If you accept this responsibility, please respond by saying, we do. We do. We do. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for who you are. And thank you for the opportunity to be able to come before you and come before bringing children that we lift up, that you've given as gifts, but we lift up to give them back to you that they may walk with you and in you all the days of their lives. God, I pray for Josh and Aubrey. I pray for Trent and Elise. I pray for their children as you are hearing these words, that these aren't just words, but that, God, they will become a vow that we do on a daily basis. God, we know there's gonna be times there's gonna be ups. We know there's gonna be times there's gonna be downs, but we walk with you through it all. Because even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil because, God, you are with us. Thank you for that promise. Thank you for these children. We pray it all in your name. Amen. Amen. We have some f gifts here for our, our little ones. And these are what are called Explorer Bibles for kids. There's one for Eleanor. Caleb, can I just give that to you? Are you strong? Can you hold it? It's heavy. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Tobin, are you strong? Can you hold it? Oh, yeah. And there's one for Evan as well. And one of the great things about these Bibles, by the way, let's go ahead and give these families a hand. Hello? Yeah. You guys are good. Thank you so much for being up here. Thanks for allowing us to be a part of this dedication ceremony. You'll see these Bibles. They're Explorer Bibles for Kids. And with the Explorer Bible for Kids, our, uh, it's a great opportunity because there's lots of interaction within the Bible for parents to do with the kids, for kids to do on their own, lots of questions, lots of discussion, lots of breakdown of specific passages for, for kids to, to understand. Well, our senior adult ministry has um, so graciously put together money around uh, Christmas time to buy our fourth and fifth graders uh, some of these Bibles. That way, when they go into class, which they'll go to here in just, just, a, just a moment, when they go into class, they'll all be in the same translation, using the same helps, and so on and so forth. So I would like to have uh, one of our main members of our senior uh, adult class come on up here, Sheriff Faison, if you don't mind. And, yes, ma'am. And I'd also like to have Bruce and Denise come up here because Bruce is our family ministries pastor and Denise is our children's ministry coordinator. And I would just like to take a moment to just have that symbolic passing of the Bible. <laughs> and it's got to have that shake kind of like that. There we go. Perfect. Yes. We are so grateful. Go ahead. Um, everybody here can see our members, uh, Dave and Andrea Moore, Terry and Shelly Scott, Joe Hurtado in the back, Doris is not here today, Jim Sorrells, Katie, I guess is in the nursery. Mary. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and Mary, where's Mary? Mary's in the back. Who else have I forgotten? Dixie. Yeah, yeah there's Dixie, Susan, Katie, all y'all stand up. <laughs> These are the seniors group, and um, we invite any other seniors that uh, would like to join us once a month for our senior lunch, and, but uh, we hope those Bibles will be greatly used. I'm sure they will. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Cher, sure, I've known you long enough that I was worried about handing you a mic. I'm not going to lie. I was waiting to see what was going to happen next. But 
I am so grateful that our seniors want to invest in each and every one of our children to see that they are growing in that way. I'm going to send those kids out to start using those Bibles right now. They're waiting at that back door, our K through fifth grade. Going to send those guys out. And as they go, I would like to ask the rest of you to actually go to a different book of the Bible today. Normally I'd say go to Ecclesiastes 5, which we will be going to shortly. But first I want you to go back to a passage we just did during this child dedication. That is Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And as you're going there, I want to ask you a couple of questions that are going to be the root questions that will be throughout this entire message today. And those root questions, I believe, are ones that we need to let simmer, kind of let soak, be the things that kind of hit us where we're at and challenge our hearts and challenge our minds in why we do what we do. Because question number one is this, is why are you here this morning? Why are you here this morning? And I'm not asking that in some sort of negative way. Trust me, I'm glad you're here this morning. I don't want you to be like, well, he obviously doesn't want us here. Uh, if you're watching online, if you're here with us, I'm glad for that. But I have to ask you why. At what reason are you here this morning? And really, the second question kind of goes for that is what are you hoping to get out of our gathering today? What are you hoping to, to receive? What are you hoping to walk away with today? And then that kind of leads us to a big second question. And this is the one I think that we need to let really simmer, and that is this. What does God want from you this morning? What does God want from you this morning? What does he want you to bring? Because I, I can't quite answer the first two questions, but I can answer that big last one. Because I know what God wants this morning, and he wants it every morning and every moment of every day. And that is undivided worship. Undivided worship. I asked you to open up to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, and I hope you've had enough time to get there, because as you uh, are opening or looking there, I want to kind of give you a little bit of background where we're at. The people of God are camped on the edge of the promised land. And, and Moses gets up to preach a sermon to them. And in it, his words were to be really their traveling instructions. That They were God's requirements for how they should live in that land that they were about to receive. And this is what he says. Verse 4 says, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. Undivided worship. Undivided worship. There is one undivided God. That's the reason why he opens up with the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And he says it right up front. And because that is who God is, we need to approach him and we need to approach worship in the same way with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength. We say it all the time, but all means all. He wants all of you. He wants every piece of every part. God's not divided, and he's not pulled in multiple directions, and neither should we be when we worship him. Unfortunately, oftentimes in our lives, we compartmentalize. God, you can have this part, but I'm going to keep that part. God, you can have my hour on Sunday morning, but I'm going to keep the other 167, and I'm going to live how I want. That's not the right approach as we see that. Moses was actually warning the people of Israel not to do that very thing. Why? Because he, like us, he knew the results of what a divided life would look like. He knew what it would look like. Many walk into church and they play the part. They are doing what they think they need to do. Saying what they think they need to say and being where they think they need to be. But our very core, at our very core, we know that when we are divided in our worship, even though we know we are loved by God, we struggle with that love because we feel like it's empty. At least our love back to him is empty. It's dry. He feels distant. I don't know how many times I've heard people tell me that. Well, God just feels distant. It's not God's fault. 
It's not God's fault in that, that he feels distant and that real relationship feels like a pipe dream. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, Moses gives us very specific instructions right up front. You know what he says first? Listen. Listen. In Ecclesiastes 5, if you want to start flipping towards that, you can do that. But in Ecclesiastes 5, Solomon gives us the same advice. He says, listen. Listen to God. Moses even takes it to the extreme by saying, hey, not just listen to God, but I want you to take the words of God and I want you to put them on your wrists and I want you to put them on your forehead and I want you to put them on the city gates and I want you to put them on your doorposts. You know why? It's to remind us that when our head is thinking certain things, it's focused on the words of God. When our hands are doing certain things, it's focused on the word of God. When we go into our house, we lead by the word of God. When we go into our city, we lead by the word of God. That is what he's trying to challenge us with. He says, don't drift. Because when you put those things aside and you forget why you do what you do, we will drift and we will drift into an attitude of ourselves. And that attitude will begin to circle itself around every aspect of our life, including our worship. When we drift from God, it becomes about us. Everything we do is about us. And let me tell you, there's plenty of churches that bank on that thinking. They bank on that thinking. They gear themselves towards you because... That's what the consumer Christianity is all about. You, the customer's king, and the church exists to provide your religious goods and services that will benefit you. We're gathered here today to make sure that you feel better about you. That's, that's the thinking. The sad truth is it's entirely possible to go to a church and hear very little about God and very much about you. That's, that's the truth of the matter. A handful of years back, we had, we had a great couple in the church and they started getting really busy on Sundays and they started to uh, let kind of their attendance fade. Now, attendance isn't the, the main thing at all, but I, I began to see they were coming very little or if at all. And it was before we had an online presence. And so I reached out to him and said, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. I'm like, oh, we're just, we're just really busy on Sundays, but don't worry, um, we're watching uh, Joel Osteen. And... I can't tell you how much inside of me broke when they said that to me. Um, and th there's a number of reasons for that that I won't get into this morning, but the big one is, is Joel Osteen and I are not the same. Thank you. So, so yeah, there's a few, a few people know what I'm already talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I would love to talk to you about it afterwards on, on why. But I will tell you this, what I'm going to say next will give you a little bit of a glimpse. Because there was a video that went viral for all the wrong reasons uh, a few years back that came out of Osteen's church. One where his wife, Victoria, got up and said these words as they were getting ready for worship. It's a shortened version. You can watch it online on YouTube. It's all there. But this is what she said. When we obey God, we're not doing it for God. We're doing it for ourselves because God takes the most pleasure when we are happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Those are the words that came out of her mouth. That's what got put onto that video. And then the person who edited the video was a person much like me in their thinking. And they went and took another movie, uh, Billy Madison. <laughs> and they added to the end of that the same thing that happened after the Scholastic Decathlon competition, where the moderator says these words, what you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I've ever heard. And no point in your rambling, incoherent response where you even close to anything that can be considered a rational thought. Everyone in the room is now just a little bit dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points and may God have mercy on your soul. There's, there's nothing else you can say with that. But here's the problem. We can laugh at it and say, oh, that is, that's ridiculous. How would somebody ever do that? But yet when we look at our own lives, are we more like that? more like her thinking than actual God's commands, more like what she said that it's about us. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but look at your own life. We too often live with us at the center of our universe and not God. That is casual contemporary Christianity. It's quite the flip of what the Westminster Catechism says when it says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But casual Christianity, that contemporary real version, seems to say it this way. The chief end of God is to enjoy man and glorify him forever. 
We see God as a mean to an end and not an end in and of himself. We want to be entertained. We want to have the feels. We want a good show. It's like we went to the Toby Mac Hits Deep concert on, on Friday night. It was a good show, but it wasn't necessarily the way the church should be run. There is a focus on God, and there is there, but it's not about us. And it actually reminds me of a story I heard Francis Chan say one time when he talked about a woman who came up to him after service and said, I didn't particularly like the music today. And his response was, it's okay, we weren't worshiping you anyways. <laughs> and that, that needs to be what we understand. It is not about us. I will tell you very honestly, right here, right now, when we plan our worship services, we have you in mind, but you are not our focus. You are not our focus. We are here to draw near to God and experience him. Not have a worship experience. Those two words together make my skin crawl. We are here to experience worship, true worship in the presence of our God. And that's why I asked you the big question this morning. Why are you here? What are you hoping to get out of this morning? And what do you think God wants from you this morning? Did you come this morning prepared to meet God? Or were you hoping to get a good show, a pep talk, and get ready for Monday? I mean, I think if you've come here enough, you know you're not getting a pep talk. (laughs) Were you looking to run through the soul car wash to clean up your mess from last week? I use the word car wash because a car wash is only necessary to pay your fees. You can go in when you feel like you're just too dirty to, to get around. That's the only time you really need to do it. I say it with all sincerity as we lead into chapter five, but if this is just about checking a box off your list, this is just about what you do on Sundays, if this is about you going through the motions, I'm telling you, you're missing it. You're missing it. And what you're doing, this religious activity, according to Solomon in Ecclesiastes five, it's meaningless. Just like everything else he's talked about under the sun, under the sun without God. If you're doing this religion thing without God as a focus, we're, we're missing it. So head over to Ecclesiastes chapter five this morning and we're gonna get rolling. And unlike other weeks, I'm only gonna do the first seven verses. Because if I did the entire chapter of, of Ecclesiastes five, we'd be here a really long time, first of all. And second of all, I don't think we'd do it justice. Because the, the whole theme of Ecclesiastes five is, is don't steal. Don't steal from God. Don't steal from others. Don't steal from yourself. But if we tie all those together, I think we miss the real point of this. Don't undercut what God deserves. Don't take from him what he deserves. So we're gonna start in verse one where it says these words. Guard your steps. Guard your steps when you go into the house of God. Better to approach in obedience than to offer a sacrifice as fools do, for they ignorantly do wrong. Now, I don't usually use the New Living Translation, but I like their translation very much so, so I had to share this verse with you from that translation where it says, as you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Man, that's good. Stings a little bit, but it's good. It is evil to make mindless offerings to God. So funny, I was talking about last night with the kids and Maylee actually looked at me. She goes, hey, dad, we should get one of those uh, custom doormats up at the front of the church that says, ears open, mouth shut, just to leave it up there at the front. I'm like, I like you. You're my daughter for sure. (laughs) Solomon opens, and he's speaking to worshipers. And he says, approach God with caution. Proceed with reverence. Come to God with care and caution and dignity and respect. And I say that he opens up, and he's talking to worshipers. And in our mind, when we think worshipers, or we even think worship, we tend to compartmentalize. But the truth of the matter is, is everyone is a worshiper. And everything we do is worship. Everyone, everywhere is continually worshiping. And if you want to know what or who you worship, we have five T's we like to to bring into our conversation. If you come to the membership class, we'll go into more detail on these. But who gets these five T's? Your time, your talent, your treasure, your testimony, and your temple. Who gets your life, your temple? Who gets what you talk about, your testimony? Who are you investing your talents in, your treasure in, your time in? Because that is probably the best indicator of what you worship. If it's not God, you need to take an evaluation of your life. The God of the Bible, the God of the universe, our creator, he deserves undivided worship because created things are unworthy of such glory. And we've said it before, and I will say it again. We are made by God, but we're also made for God. 
Our worship is to be only to the one true God in the right way and with the right heart. Open your ears. Listen. Open your ears. Listen to what the first thing that Moses said in Deuteronomy as well. Listen. Maybe your grandparents told you the same thing that mine told me. God gave you two ears and one mouth. So why? You could listen twice as much as you talk. And, and it's hard for us to listen, though. And you know why? Because we have all the answers already. I don't need you to tell me what you think because I already know what I think. I don't, I don't need your input. And we do that to God. God, you don't understand what I'm going through. God, you don't understand what this is about. And we come with that attitude into church. I remember when I was a kid, I got told a lot, quit running in church. Because I had a lot of energy. I know that probably surprises you. But I was around and I was moving. Maybe you had the same thing. Maybe you've already told a kid today to quit running in church. This building's perfect. It's got laps. <laughs> and... and, and the thing that I wanted to say to you today is, is that maybe you're not running physically in church, but maybe we need to take that same advice and quit running emotionally and quit running spiritually and quit running mentally. All the things that are going on inside of your head, all the things that are happening right now, quit running through your mind the excuses or your situation or anything else that might say, I don't need to listen. Quit it. Shut your mouth. Shut down the train wreck of your thoughts and get ready to listen. And that's not just here at church. That is every morning of every day. Before we walk into a building, before worship begins, it begins. Take some time and pray. And simply ask God to help you hear what he has to say, what he has to show you, and then be prepared to listen. Prepare yourself to meet God and then listen to him. Listen to him. The actual translation of that word, listen, both here in um, Ecclesiastes as well as in Deuteronomy, actually has the added context of obedience attached to it. So it's not just listen. It is listen and obey. Now, I've done lots of premarital counseling, and I've done lots of marital counseling for people. I remember a guy saying to me one time this. He said, my wife and I had words, but he never got a chance to use his. Sometimes I feel that's the way it is with God. We're going to have words, God, but I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. He feels like a flight attendant at the beginning of a flight. Anybody in here actually pay attention to what a flight attendant says? Nobody's sitting there going, hmm, I'm going to grab out that information card, and I'm going to see exactly how to exit this plane in case it goes down in, in a body of water, the fact that we live in a desert. You know, th those kind of thoughts start going through our mind, and we don't listen. But you know when we start to freak out? is when we're in a crisis situation, and we forgot what we're supposed to actually do because we didn't listen up front. Kind of sounds like the way we approach God. We get into this crisis situation. But when we stop and listen, we really do open ourselves up to what God's going to say and we help ourselves avoid two pitfalls when it comes to our worship time. And by the way, our worship time is always. One is coming to impress as if God needs our list of accomplishments this week to, impressed, to, to be impressed in order to answer our prayers or give us what we want. And maybe that might be a, a message of better fitting for next week during the Super Bowl because people will be praying and doing really good this week so their team wins. But the truth is, there's a second part that we do. We come to demand. Like God's some genie in a bottle that needs us to, or needs to do what we say when we say it. And it's all because, well, I went to church, so therefore, God, you need to. When we stop and listen and focus on him, it changes our entire perspective. Second part of the verse one says this, better to approach in obedience than to offer sacrifice as fools do, for they ignorantly do wrong. So Solomon goes from establishing God as the center of our life of worship to how should we approach it, and how should we not approach it? As fools. So don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Well, how do fools do it? Well, they use their offering and they use their sacrifice as a form of ritual or even worse, a form of manipulation. Somehow, some way, we think that the reason we do what we do is either because we have to, we go through these motions, or we have something to gain because if I do this, then God will do that as a favor because, you know, he owes me. And then there's also that idea of the car wash. There's a debt that has to be paid, so I gotta go to church and, and wash my, off my sins in that way. One of the commentaries I read actually said this, just because we go to church and worship God does not mean you're not a fool. I'm like, ah, stop it. 
That, that hurts, because the worst part is the fool is ignorant to the fact that he's doing exactly the opposite of impressing God or trying to win his favor. God is not okay with it. God, through his prophets, often, often criticized the mindset. And just for one example, look at 1 Samuel 15, 22, which says, does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey, or that word again, to listen, is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. Listen, pay attention, obey. This is the way it was in the Old Testament temple. It's also the way it still is today. But again, our thinking gets in the way. There's this idea of true worship and there's idea of false worship. The thing is they both are considered worship. The true worship is this, love God and love others. Jesus himself talks about that. Then there's the false worship that says, love self and use others. And that's what Ecclesiastes has said in these first four chapters. That's where we tend to find ourselves. This false worship, we fall victim to not listening. We fall victim to not paying attention and not obeying, but instead, you know what we do? I tell God what I'm going to obey and what I'm not. I will tell him that yes, I will submit to this part of scripture because I agree with it, but this part over here, I have a different interpretation. And that's how I will approach you, God, for the things that I don't want to do. As if I'm God and you are not. But let me say this. God does not run a democracy for his people. He does not set up debates or votes for us to choose what we think is in God's word, whether it fits with culture or not. God has revealed himself and his commands and his words, and we need to listen, and we need to pay attention, and we need to obey. Now, we are one verse in. That's the reason why I couldn't do them all today, okay? So let's move on to verse two and three. As we look at verse two and three, it goes into the object of prayer. Prayer, and this is what it says. Do not be hasty to speak and do not be impulsive to make a speech before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Just as dreams accompany much labor, so also a fool's voice comes with many words. Now, I'm not going to go into as much detail on this one because he's continuing that thought from verse 1. And that thought from verse 1 is, is that thought of manipulation. But the truth is, as he's mentioned here, is this. We often forget who God is. And even more so, we forget who we are, or even more than that, who we are not. Who we are not. See, God is God, and we are not and God is in heaven outside of time and space, and we're just specks of dust on this temporary earth. God is Lord of all. We're just bond servants, or better even translations, we're slaves. And as we prepare to worship him, we need to come to him with that mindset. We need to come to him in humility, bowing before him and realizing who he really is. Realizing that, again, puts us into proper perspective. How many times have you gone to God in prayer and thought this giant mountain in your life is this thing that is so overwhelming, but when you take it from God's perspective, you realize it's just a molehill. It's just another thing to get over. How many times have we done that? But when we pray and we put it in proper perspective, it changes everything. Like I said, we went to that Toby Mac Hits Deeps tour on Friday night. There's a number of Christian artists that were there, but two of them were, of course, Toby Mac and... Um, Mac Powell, Toby Mac, formerly of DC Talk, Mac Powell, formerly of Third Day, both of which I watched when I was in high school as I have my high school students, uh, kids standing next to me and going, man, yeah, that's, that's interesting that these guys are still doing this and they're trying to dance around the stage and they're not young. And, and so um, the thing that I, I was blown away by though was Mac Powell pulled out an old song from Third Day. And it's maybe a song that you've heard before, maybe you remember, but it's called God of Wonders. And I began to just listen to that. Of course, my message was already kind of going through my mind. It was on Friday night. But he says, God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are what? Holy, holy. God of wonders, the universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. You know what holy means? It means set apart from all of us. Set apart so much more than all of us. And the universe declares that matters to Steve. My question is, is that how we approach God, that he is holy? That he is so much more and set apart than us, that he is majestic, both in our lives and in our prayers? Because we should. And you know why we should? Because that is exactly who he is. Solomon says, because of that's who he is, you know what we need to do? Stop talking so much. Let your words be few. 
saw a John Bunyan quote that I posted on our social media on Friday. It said this, in prayer, it's better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. Somehow we get this idea, and obviously it's not a new idea because Solomon's talk about it too, but the, the more words we have, the more eloquent our prayer is, the more King James English that we use when we pray that God is more likely to hear and listen to our prayers. Sometimes I think we think that our prayer is a microphone and God's up there, he's got both headphones on, he's like, oh, here's Matt praying. Oh, yeah, use thee and thy 15 times. This is gonna be a good prayer, I know it. That's not the way that he approaches it. As a matter of fact, I think it's quite the opposite. He doesn't sit up there with, with headphones on. I think he's got a stethoscope. Because you know what a stethoscope does? It listens to the heart and it listens to the lungs. I think that's what he's listening for is what is coming out. We've sang the songs plenty of times. There's the one that says it's your breath in our lungs and we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. He's, he's listening for that. It's, it's the idea of that old worship song, this is the air I breathe. And your holy presence, it's living in me. He's listening for that. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here am I to say that you are my God. Altogether lovely. Altogether worthy. Altogether wonderful to me. This morning, actually, getting, uh, getting ready, Christy had the, the, uh, the music playing, and the song came on, As the Deer. I'm like, I haven't heard this song in like a thousand years. But I sat there and listened to him and went, oh, as a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. You alone are my heart's desire. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Is that the cry of our heart? I mean, when we get to the vows and we're making that vow that, God, you're the one that I long to worship, and then we don't, where are we at? What heart are we coming, with God, coming to God with? It goes back to that first question. Why are we here? What do we hope to gain from God that's more than just getting to be with him? That's more than just getting to grow in him. Verse three basically says, if you think you work harder in vocalizing your prayer, if you think that you, you try harder, you're living in a dream world, a fantasy world made up by you because that's not how God works. Matter of fact, God tells us how he works in Matthew chapter six, verse seven, eight, when Jesus says, hey, don't babble on in, in prayer. Don't be like the pagans. And then in Luke 18, he says, hey, pray like that tax collector who beat his chest and said, I'm not worthy, versus the Pharisee who just went on and on in prayer. It's about the heart, not about the words. And that takes us into verses four through six, which is a step further as he gets into those vows. He says, when you make a vow to God, which, by the way, this was completely coincidental. We did this today on the same day we did a child dedication. When you make a vow to God, don't delay in fulfilling it because he does not delight in fools. Fulfill what you vow. Better that you do not vow than you vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth bring guilt on you and do not say in the presence of a messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry with your words and destroy the work of your hands? There's a lot that we have not covered about the temple and a lot of the ways that worship takes place. We could have done that, but it would have been its own class, I think, just trying to break that down. But there is one thing I do want to let you know in this particular part of the passage, that when people entered, part of their worship was to make vows. They were making vows that God would do something in order, for, or they would do something for God in order for God to do specific requests for them. The vow is talked about in Deuteronomy, multiple places, and an example is found in Numbers 21 when the Israelites make a vow, they overcome, they conquer, and then they fulfill that vow by doing what they said they were gonna do by killing everybody. Or even what we talked about this morning when Hannah asked God for a child. And she vowed he'd be a Nazarite and serve with Eli in the tabernacle if she was blessed with said child who became Samuel. Guess what this happens today though, doesn't it? We say to God in a time of crisis, I swear to you God, if you get me out of this situation, if you can just get me through this situation, I will. If you can get me into a situation. Now, how many people have, have made a vow to God, if you just give me a spouse, then I will. If you just give me a child, then I will. The same thing. But the thing is, is that when the crisis is over, oftentimes that vow goes unfulfilled on our side. 
What about when we get convicted by the Holy Spirit through something we hear or something that we see or something that we experience or even as we go back to the song, something we sing and we say, God, I need to change. I need to confess. I need to, to follow through and then we don't. Or when we stand before our family and our friends to make a vow in marriage. I'll tell you, anytime I do premarital counseling, I tell the couple, vows are for life, not for the wedding day. It's a vow. It's a vow. It's not just something we say. Or what we even did here this morning, promising to raise your children in the Lord or as a church to help them raise their children. It's a vow. But what if we don't? What promises in your five T's have you not kept? God, I promise I'll give you my time. I'll serve. I'll give you my treasure. I, I, I'll give. I'll give you my testimony. I'll talk about you when, when, when the, the opportunity presents itself, your talents, your temple, whatever it might be. I'll give it to you, God, and then we don't. The problem is, really, we make the vow, hoping God holds up his end of the bargain, but then it doesn't go as smoothly or it goes a little differently than we planned, so we bail out of our responsibility. I guess the best mental picture that I had for this is a roller coaster. Remember the first time I ever went on a roller coaster? It was Goliath at Six Flags Magic Mountain in, Cal in California. It was a wooden roller coaster. I was 13 years old. I was with my Uncle Jim, and he made me go. And I hated every second of it. I love roller coasters. Well, I loved roller coasters. Now that I've gotten older and I got some weird ear things, they make me sick. But that's a whole other story. But I remember getting on that Goliath and I made this mistake. I kept my eyes closed because I was scared. You don't keep your eyes closed at a roller coaster. You keep them open so you know what's coming next. Well, I think sometimes in our lives, we get caught up we get locked in this ride with God and we're like, oh, there is ups and there is downs and there is twists and there is turns and occasionally God's gonna throw us for a loop. I want off. But you're locked in. You don't get off mid-ride. But that's kind of what happens with these vows. Who Solomon says, don't get on the roller coaster. It's better for you not to get on the roller coaster. Keep your mouth shut and just stay out of it. That's what he says. If you can't keep that vow, he throws out this, hey, don't say it in the presence of the messenger that this was some sort of mistake. Now, you might be like, well, what is that? Well, there was a messenger in the temple that would hear your vow, and if you didn't keep it, he would come to your house. He would come to your house and remind you to pay up. Kind of like a collection agency, a little gangster mafia thing going on there in the temple. You've got the brass knuckles waiting at the door making you pay up kind of thing. What if we had that in the church today? How much better would our vows be? Most of you wouldn't have showed up this morning. No, we're not dedicating our children. That is not the way it's going to go down. But that is where we see this. We need to understand that our words matter, that these words matter. They matter to God, and they should matter to us. Jesus very clearly said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We know this teaching is not a part of the world system. So what if? What if the church was the one shining light where vows actually matter? <laughs> what if we held to them? Then it comes down to this driving force behind it all, God himself. Verse seven says, for many dreams bring futility, so do many words, therefore, conclusion, fear God. Fear God. Fantasy thinking and endless talk bring futility. It's meaningless, so fear God. But honestly, I think most people have a hard time with the concept of fearing the Lord because we have, a, we have a culture that we live in that literally has zero reverence for any sort of authority. Any teachers in here deal with authority issues on a regular basis about people disobeying parents, teachers, coaches, any figure of authority? There's no respect. There's none of that. And that lack of respect is bled over into what we might call this casual Christianity where Jesus is thought of lower than he actually is we have brought him down to our level and there's this rebellion against his word and his authority that isn't just tolerated it is now celebrated going back to the beginning it becomes about us it's that idea that god is my co-pilot that bumper sticker can i just say that is theologically incorrect god is not my co-pilot he does not need my help he is my pilot, and I am here to obey. I am the one who 
falls in line because he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he inspires awe and he demands my life. We should approach him in our time of worship in this way. See, coming to meet with God in worship is, is literally inviting the kingdom of God to rule and reign in our lives. That, that's what we're calling out for. That's what our songs say. We need to take him seriously. Because when we do, it draws out that undivided focus to our King of Kings and to our Lord of Lords. And it draws us to a humble submission to just shut up and listen and obey that we might become more like him. I think our challenge this morning is, is to stop going through the motions. To stop going through the motions and realize, God, who he actually is. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure if you remember, there was a song not too long ago that came out by Matthew West, and he said, I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to spend one more day without your all-consuming passion living inside of me. These are the words that he said. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I'd given everything instead of going through the motions? What if I had given everything? Undivided worship every day because he's worthy. So let's stop going through the motions and fear God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for the way you guide. Thank you for the way you direct. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Because without those things, I'd be a mess, or at least a bigger mess than I already am. Thank you for your forgiveness when I do drift. Thank you for your forgiveness and grace and mercy when I get to that point where I'm just going through the motions. God, I, I think about all the things that you are. I think about all the things that you've done I think about how worthy you are of the worship that I can bring. I pray that in my own personal life that I don't get distracted, that I give you my undivided worship, that I give you all that you deserve, all my heart, all my mind, all my strength. My guess, God, is that today there's other people praying the same thing lifting you up and thinking of who you are and asking for forgiveness for making you less than who you are. God, we want you to have all full reign. We want you to have all full rule. We want you to have all the glory. When we try and steal it from you, God, it's on us. Please forgive us. Pray that in your name. Amen. I'm going to jump down here in the front, and I would love to talk to you about who God is. Maybe this is like kind of your first time coming into church and going, wow, that was a bit more than I was expecting when I came into church. I thought I was just coming in to sing some songs, do a child dedication, and walk out. I would love to talk to you about who Jesus is and why what we just said is so important, to make him number one in your life, to make him the worship. Not all the other things the world has to offer, but him. I'll be down here in the front to talk to you as we sing this last song. Tough. Oh
stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Jesus, your name. says if you've been forgiven and if you've been redeemed this is the song that we sing this is the song that's in our hearts that you are holy and holy forever god we may we approach you in that way every moment of every day may you have all the praise and all the glory this morning as we go our separate ways may you be lifted up and shine through our lives pray in that name is above all names amen ladies and gentlemen thanks so much for being here today loved having you guys hopefully i didn't crush <laughs> your toes and you don't come back next week i hope you understand ecclesiastes is just that way so uh we're enjoying the book i hope you continue to go through it with us we're looking forward to chapter six next week we have our membership class right afterwards today if you want to stick around for it even though you didn't sign up love to have you other than that i'm going to ask most of you to kind of start making your way out because we got to do the membership class in here so i'm going to have to set up tables and all that kind of fun stuff like that other than that have a great day don't forget to uh, grab one of the new bullets on your way out the door thank you <laughs>